going to the University of Arizona, had a visit from his, uh, her sister and brother. So the more formal part here, uh, Dr. Shubin Tseng is the Agnes N. Howry Chair in Environment uh, and Professor of Atmospheric Sciences mm -hmm. at the University of Arizona, uh, as well as the Director of the University of Arizona <coughs> Climate Dynamics and Hydrometeorological Center. He earned his PhD in Atmospheric Sciences from Col Colorado State in 1992. Uh, through over 160 peer-reviewed papers, Dr. Zink's research has focused on land-atmosphere-ocean interface processes, weather and climate modeling, hydrometeorology, remote sensing, and nonlinear dynamics. His model parameterizations and global value-added observation-based data sets have been used widely in weather and climate models, including NSEP, European Center, CESM, and WARF, and others. And he acts as a bridge linking measurement technology, in situ and satellite data, and the modeling communities. And I can say that from firsthand experience, as can several of us. Um, he is a fellow of the American Meteorological Society and the University of Arizona Academic Leadership Institute. He received the Special Creativity Award from the National Science Foundation and the Outstanding Faculty Award from the University of Arizona Asian American Faculty, Staff, and Alumni Association. He is a co chair or member of numerous committees related to NOAA, NASA, NSF, DOE, AMS, AGU, NCAR, and international programs such as CLIVAR, GWEX, and ILEAPS. Related to NOAA, he was a co-chair and member of three National Academy reports on weather and big data at NOAA, and is currently serves on the NOAA Science Advisory Board Environmental Information Services Working Group and the NOAA, NASA, USGS Decadal Survey and air quality panel. So, welcome, Professor Zing. And we're looking forward to a nice, uh, <laughs> uh, a nice seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And uh, thank you, everybody, for your patience and uh, coming to the seminar, both here and for people online. And particularly, I want to thank Minji for coming here from Silver Spring. It's quite an honor to have Minji here. Um, today, I will talk about our recent research on snow from data set <coughs> development to NWS products evaluation and <coughs> to snow impact on CFS subseasonal to seasonal prediction. Uh, first, I'll talk about my collaboration history with EMC to set the stage, then talk about the snow <coughs> and finally talk about the implications uh, for the R2O strategy of the NCEF. Uh, as Mike mentioned, throughout the years, my group has developed many model parameterizations and the value-added global data sets, and many of them have been widely used, including implemented in European Center and uh, at NCA CESM and many other models, and particularly uh, in EMC operational models. This includes the ocean surface turbulence and the NOAA nanoskin temperature. And just this morning, Mike and Mike, and that's a good name for EMC director and deputy director, Mike and Mike just told me our max snow albedo data will be implemented in the next version of GFS. That's very pleasant to hear. Uh, and our NOAA snow model improvements was also fully tested for implementation in EMC, but not implemented yet. And uh, we have also forwarded our seasonal hurricane activity forecast methods to colleagues at the CPC. Just as an example, uh, our first R2 success at EMC was about ocean surface fluxes. It's easy to evaluate the operational model of Nuxis using any kind of data, but it's much more challenging to understand what are the reasons for the particular deficiencies or good performances. For that reason, we did some special. I mean, 20 years ago, I contacted all the major centers about their specific subroutines for turbulence parameterizations over ocean. And then we read the codes, we understood the codes, then we converted the subroutines into an independent program, then tested the algorithm itself <coughs> using in-situ data. 
As an example here, we choose a netting heat flux in panel A, sensible heat in B, and a wind stress over ocean as a function of wind based on the Toka core data of the Western Pacific own pool. And this observation is indicated by the plus sign. You can see with the increase of winds, NCEP algorithm systematically overestimates latent heat flux. And uh, similarly, European center model also overestimates wind, uh, latent heat flux at a higher wind speed. Because we run those subroutines, we know the mechanisms very well. So we figure out what's wrong in those parameterizations. And we made the suggestions to European Center. They implemented immediately. Then for NCEP, Huang Lu Pan gave us the subroutine. And our recommendation was to use our own algorithm. And that's represented by the Sonnet 9 in the figure with overall very good performance. And Huang Lu subsequently implemented the algorithm into the operational model. And then what's the benefit? Uh, for example, a decade later, we use the measurements from 11 um, cruises uh, to evaluate um, more than 10 turbulent fluxes from different centers. Here, just as an example, I show the results from the old NCEP real analysis. That's based on the original turbulence parameterization and the newer CFSR. That's based on our own turbulence parameterization over ocean. And uh, again, because we have the subroutines, we can decompose the total bias in fluxes into the biases due to the bulk of variable uncertainty, such as ocean surface wind and temperature, humidity, versus residual uncertainty, primarily due to the turbulence parameterization itself. Now, if you look at the table for the latent heat flux with the implementation of our algorithm, you can see CFSR reduce the residual uncertainty by more than 50%. That's pretty dramatic improvement. And we also see good improvement in the sensible heat flux and the wind stress. Keep in mind, if you don't do this kind of detailed process study, if you just look at the turbulent flux itself, results could be misleading. For this case, for example, we can see the significant improvement in sensible heat flux and in winter stress, but we see that latent heat flux actually becomes even worse because of the two sources of uncertainties. For that case, that's due to the near surface atmospheric state, such as the winds and the temperature and the humidity. Now, let's switch from ocean to land, and our second success is about land skin temperature. The bottom panel shows the green vegetation fraction. The point here is the western U.S. is semi-arid region. And the top panel shows the GFS minus goals land surface skin temperature difference for July during the day. You can see there is a systematic cold bias over semi-arid region up to 10 degrees Celsius. Of course, this is an issue that has been recognized by scientists for many years, and many methods have been tried with very limited success. Then about 10 years ago, we worked with the EMC NAND team, at that time first led by Ken Mitchell, and now by Michael Ake, we came up with a solution, and the results are much nicer. As an example, compare with observational data over desert rock in Nevada, and uh, at the gaze over Tibet, China, the default NOAA land model has a very large bias. And with our solution, you can see we reduce the bias by more than 70%. Here, I just had to point out this type of issues are not just the problem for NOAA model, it's also the problem for most of the other land surface models. Here, as an example, we show the results for the community land model CLM. Again, we saw, we can see the big bias, and then with our solution, again, we can see the significant improvement of the model performance. When you improve land surface skin temperature, 
the immediate impact is on data simulation. For example, in the in the original D GFS, because of the very cold bias model, cannot accept the satellite radiance data. Effectively, most of the remote sensing data for surface sensitive infrared channels would be rejected. In contrast, with our improvements, we reduce the brightness temperature in the radiance of simulation, and correspondingly, we can see the significant increase in the number of satellite radiance data assimilated. Now, with this kind of collaboration history, we can talk about our recent snow work. And uh, probably everybody agrees <coughs> snow is very important because it affects the energy cycle through the albedo, the water cycle through the rainfall, snowfall, and snow melt, and the land atmosphere coupling through the insulation of ground by snow. From observational perspective, snow cover is relatively easy to measure from space. And indeed, the multiple global grid data sets are vulnerable. In contrast, the snow water equivalent, or SWE, and the snow depths are much more challenging to measure from space or to upscale from point measurements to area average. Still, there are many data sets that have been produced, including operational analysis from NCEP and other operational centers, real analysis, global land data simulation system, and satellite remote sensing, and the combination of those products. But the real question is, how good are these SWE and snow depth products? And uh, first, we care about NCEP, so we are asking, <coughs> the first question is, how good are NCEP snow depth initializations? and initializations from other centers. Here we pick up a few two degree by two degree boxes over different states. And then we compare with our own upscaled estimates of snow depths as indicated by the black line. The bottom line without going into individual products is snow depths initializations for EMC, GFS, CFS, and LAM overall are 77% below our upscaled area estimates on average. So there is a very substantial underestimate of snow depths. The reason, there are two. One of them is primarily based on the poor FWA <coughs> snow depth analysis, plus some special methods used in the snowy assimilation process. And of course, the solution I'm going to talk about later is to develop a better snow depth data set. And then, how about the SWE? Because that's really relevant for the water cycle and energy cycle. Overall, the conclusion is simple. SWE initialization is even worse than <coughs> snow depths. And the reason is because of the use of constant snow density or very simple treatment in the snow initialization. And again, the solution would be to develop a better snow density parameterization, and the better solution would be to develop a consistent SWE and snow depth data. And that's what I'm going to present next. And the first is about a new snow density parameterization, specifically we just published for snow data assimilation in operational centers. And uh, without going into the details, some of the key points of our new snow density parameterization is that it includes up to 10 snow layers. It's driven by daily snowfall and the two meter air temperature. It considers overburden and destructive metamorphism it considers the melting pond over snow, and it considers six snow classes. Again, as indicated here, uh, from tundra to taiga, prairie, maritime, ephemeral, and alpine. 
because that's something developed by snow scientists to consider different snow regimes. And uh, the first thing we did was to use in situ the USDA snow tail data to compare different uh, densities, one from our own parameterization and the densities from different products as a part of the national land data assimilation system. The observation is black line and our parameterization is red line. The simple conclusion here is our snow density parameterization performs really much better than any of the other densities. And for NCEP NOAA model, it underestimates snow density, the blue line, early in the season and overestimates it later in the season. Now here I have to be careful because we drive our parameterization using the in situ data well, the densities are from NAND data simulation system. You could argue some of the performance is influenced by the forcing data. So next, we obtain the subroutines of the NOAA NAND model. Then we drive the subroutine along with our parameterization using the same atmospheric forcing data. And again, the overall conclusion remains the same our snow <coughs> parameterization performs better. Overall, this is a new parameterization, very simple to implement at any operational centers for snow data simulation. Particularly, we want to combine snow depth measurements from lots of NWS volunteers and the snow, depth, snow water equivalent measurements, which is more challenging to measure. Now, with those preparations, here I can talk about our new daily 4 kilometer snow water equivalent depth and the fraction data set over continental US <coughs> from 1981 to present. And uh, first, we have to ask what would be the ground truth data to evaluate different graded products I have talked about earlier. It's not easy. It's a very old problem. Many papers have been published. Many methods have been developed. And uh, what's a big deal for us to come here to claim we have something that can be taking us a reference data set to evaluate other products. For that reason, we must have a higher standard. Now we can come back to the data sources. We can develop data sets based on surface networks with dense measurement sites over some regions of the world. Over US, we are very fortunate to have hundreds of snow tail sites with measurements of SWE and snow depths. There are even thousands or tens of thousands of National Weather Service co-op, those are the volunteer sites with snow depth measurements because depth is a little bit easier to measure compared with snow water equivalent. Even though we recognize the site representativeness is a concern, there are other data sources, airborne data, river discharge, and satellite passive microwave <coughs> remote sensing. They all have pros and cons. And our strategy here is to use the dense network over continental US to develop our data sets. And then the key question we have to answer is how do we upscale from those in situ point measurements to area averages? And we have developed multiple steps in our methods. The first step is the most crucial. And to understand this step, we have to talk about the previous methods for the snow interpolation from points to points, <coughs> from points to area averages. Almost no matter what method you use for interpolation or for data simulation, you have to consider the distance, the horizontal distance and the vertical elevation between sites to other sites or your area average. But is that the right way to go? Here as an example for panel A, we show the seasonal maximum SWE versus elevation using the snow tail in situ data. You can see the relation is far from tight. 
Okay, so it's not really a strong relation. Next, however, if we show the maximum sway versus the snowfall accumulated from day one, then you can see the relationship becomes much tighter. Then in panel C, we just show the ratio between the sway over accumulated snowfall versus elevation. Now, essentially, you see there is no dependence on elevation. That's very nice. Based on this simple observation, our first step is to compute the ratio of sweep at any day over accumulated snowfall minus snow <coughs> operation. If everything is perfect in the world, of course this ratio would be one. But we know there is no such thing as perfect things. So it's not going to be one. And uh, in our approach, we separate snowfall from rainfall based on a temperature threshold by analyzing in situ data over continental US. Similarly, we estimate snow operation based on empirical formulation using two meter air temperature again based on the station data. You might argue, hey, Huben, you just came up with a simple model to estimate those quantities. Indeed, it's an empirical formulation. But it turns out, because we do the horizontal interpolation using the ratio, turns out those small uncertainties do not matter too much. I'm going to convince you later. And then our second step is to use our new snow density model to assimilate both SWE and the snow depth data across the canals. And then for step three, it's pretty straightforward. Now we can interpolate the in situ normalized SWE from step one to any grids. Here we choose the four kilometer grids because we can use the prism, any four kilometer precipitation and the temperature products <coughs> to compute the accumulated snowfall minus operation. And then with steps three and four, we produce four kilometer gridded SWE, mm -hmm. and then with our density, produce the consistent snow depth data. That's all the details of our methods. And you might argue, probably any group can produce a data set. How do you know your data set is better? When you know there is no such thing as real ground truth, so it's not easy to claim anything. And here, even worse, we want to use our new data set as the basis to evaluate all other products. We must have a higher standard. For that reason, we have designed three rigorous tests. First one is about point-to-point -point interpolation. I just talk to myself. Okay. And uh, we pick up a 10 degree by 10 degree box showing the results in panel A and 2 degree by 2 degree box in panel B where there are probably enough point measurements. <coughs> then we just select a limited number of stations for the calibration and using the remaining sites for validation. And then we compare our method indicated by the black line versus other methods but all of them using the SWE itself for interpolation. And we can draw multiple conclusions. Two of them are most important. You can see clearly, first, the black line, our method has a much smaller error across the board for all the tests. Second, our method is very robust as the error indicated by the black line are nearly the same if we use 90% of the sites for calibration, that's easy, anybody can do. Or 30%, that's pretty challenging. 10%, very challenging. 5%, extremely challenging. But for our method, you can see results are essentially the same, indicating the robustness of our method. Then for operational application, it's not about the point interpolation, it's about the point to area interpolation. And again, once you go to area, there are no such thing as a ground truth. So you have to accept a certain thing. And here we pick up 
two degree by two degree area over Colorado and over Wisconsin. One represents areas with topography <coughs> one pretty flat. And over those regions, there are more than enough in situ measurements. So if we accept our interpolated area average using all in situ data as the reference data, then we can do our sensitivity tests by using only 50% of the sites <coughs> for interpolation for the whole area, 25% and 10%. Then we show all the results in those two panels. You can see overall they agree with each other very well, no matter how many stations are actually used, okay, showing the robustness of our methods. And the final name We compare our derived daily snow cover. We just uh, make it simple. Assume when the sway is greater than three millimeter, we assume it's hundred percent cover. With other three snow cover data sets, here you have to recognize the snow cover is much easier to measure from MODIS, from VIRS, from any kind of satellite remote sensing because the reflections is very much different from a snow-free area. So here we compare with the MODIS, NESTIS IMS, that's a combination of MODIS and the in situ data, and then the Rutgers University, that's a combination of everything they can get. And we can see, compare with the MODIS and IMS, both have a resolution very close to ours. The agreements are really very good. Keep in mind, I'm not talking about the seasonal average here. I talk about every day's snow cover comparison. Dark color indicates the beginning of the water year, and the light color indicates the end of May. So for every day's comparison, the agreement is pretty nice. The agreement is less compared with Rutgers University, partly because that's a 25 kilometer fairly coarse resolution product. And here, let me show you an animation uh, about this comparison. The top panel is our sweet data, and this is our derived snow cover, and this is a nested IMS snow cover. <laughs> then we pick up six regions, and here we show the area average snow fraction. Uh, our results would be blue, and the nested would be green. <coughs> okay, in our data developments, we use nothing from. IMS snow cover. So our whole data development was 100% independent from the snow cover development. The other thing is for the snow cover product. Oh, it's over? Oh, that's okay. We don't know what's the critical value for the snow water equivalent for our case is three millimeter. We can even talk about the fractional snow cover. Overall, they agree with each other extremely well, including the special pattern. But just as an example, well, it's interesting we stop here. Everywhere they agree with each other very well, but here for New England, the nasties IMS snow cover drop abruptly by something like 50% in January. And again, okay, we have not done the additional evaluation, but my own guess is something <coughs> incorrect in the NESTIS IMS data, because for New England in January, I cannot imagine a 50% drop in a matter of a couple of days in snow cover, but we have not done 
the detailed evaluation of that one. Otherwise, they agree with each other really beautifully. What is the uh, Daily. Daily. And uh, now, if I have convinced you, <coughs> we have a fairly decent snow product for operational implementation and also probably for the evaluation of other products. And uh, here, we show our observe, not really observe, we just use the term OPS, the maximum SWE, and then that's in panel A. And in all other panels, we show the maximum SWE <coughs> from each product over our product, over panels. This includes panel B for CFSR, panel J for GL does 1, no R, and uh, panel L for GL does 2, no R. You can see the bluish color. That means all those products, real analysis and global NAND data simulation system snow, all of them underestimate the maximum we over us. Okay, it's not difficult to show this kind of results, but the more challenging issue is what's the main reason for this underestimate? You can think of two reasons. One is the atmospheric forcing deficiencies. For example, if you have less snowfall, of course you have less sweet on the ground. The other one would be deficiencies in land models and in snow data simulation. Then the question is, how do we separate them just based on data analysis? So we spend much time to figure these things out. And the first, in the panel A, we choose the accumulative precipitation <coughs> from observation. Then for panel B to panel L, we show the ratio of the corresponding results from different products versus the observed cumulative precipitation. What you can see is that the color changes. Some panels show the reddish color, some show bluish color. The point is, some products have too much precipitation or snowfall, and some have too little. However, Nearly all these products have too little maximum SWE from the previous slide. The point here is deficiencies in atmospheric forcing data cannot explain this widespread underestimation of SWE in those products. So the logical conclusion would be the other parts, the modeling and snow assimilation. Then which part? exactly is responsible. This is even more challenging. We spend a lot of kind of stupid hours trying to figure this out. Finally, we find something we feel exciting enough to share with you. <coughs> Here we show the figure in terms of the daily we change near freezing points for x axis versus the ratio we minus divided by snowfall minus the ratio from observation. Now you can see clearly SWE is underpredicted more severely for real analysis products that operate more snow near freezing point temperature. So if you mess up the snow operation near freezing points, then you are going to have unrealistic SWE evolution with time. The point here is SWE underestimation in real analysis GL does is primarily caused by deficiencies in land model, particularly snow operation near freezing points and snow data of simulation. And uh, now we can apply our data to something else, satellite remote sensing. Okay, in panel A, we show our maximum SWE. Then in panel C, D, E, we compare three different remote sensing products. We show the ratio in panel C from M3E, that's a microwave <coughs> passive, to our product, then that's from NASA. And then global snow from Europe, ESA, that's a combination of satellite and in situ data. Then panel E is from Canada, the Kansas, by combining all those data, combining global snow view analysis and GL does. And uh, you can draw a lot of conclusions overall. What we want to 
uh, can conduct its M3E and the GNOME Snow the 25 kilometer resolution severely underestimates the sway over mountain Earth's average temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, the Earth's average temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. 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 The Earth's average temperature of 100 degrees Celsius
that short wave radiation on the ground. And then with less water going into the soil, the soil moisture is decreased. With less soil moisture, then the energy partitioning goes to sensible heat flux, and we see the overall increase in sensible heat flux. And accordingly, the corresponding increase in temperature. The latent heat flux is more complicated. Lower soil moisture would tend to decrease latent heat flux. But this is a higher latitude energy supply is very important. With increased net short wave radiation, we can see the increase of net heat flux in some areas and a decrease in other areas. Now, the question is, what are the reasons for those pretty dramatic climatological differences? There are three factors. First, the initial snow state on April 1st is dramatically different. Second, the ocean state on April 1st initialized on April 1st versus the forecasted state from January 1st on April 1st, they are different. And the atmospheric state is also different. Of course, here we focus on the seasonal forecasting, so the atmospheric state may not matter too much. But how do we separate the ocean impact versus the snowpack <coughs> impact? Of course, we can do CFS forecasting by isolating those impacts even though I hope our friends in EMC will do that. Then you do another CFS forecasting using the SST and the ocean state from January forecasts. Then you repeat, then you can isolate those effects. But I always feel when we talk about the O2R, you talk about you use all those good ensemble members forecasting every month for 30 years from EMC. Can we dig out anything? without running the models? And the answer is yes, and that's our idea. Here, if we use D3, DT, and DSST to refer to the difference between January 1st and April 1st the forecasts, then for the left panel, we show the temporal coronation from 82 to 2009 between D3 and April 1st. That's the kind of initial state. On April to June, DT, the temperature difference, we can see over many regions, we have a very robust negative creation and negative creation, significant and very robust. In contrast, for the right panel, we show the correlation between the April to June DSST over oceans north of 30 degree north versus April to June DT over different regions. You see over land, essentially there is no statistically significant correlation. Then we repeated the correlation analysis using SST over Enso region, similar results. Global Ocean, similar results. Um, PDO region, similar results. The point is, there is an exciting potential new finding for the CFS system. That is, for transition seasonal forecasting and interseasonal forecasting, snowpack might provide a substantial predictability source. That's a big deal because for the transition season, there is not much predictability source from ocean, from atmosphere. If this is further confirmed, it's really a good news for EMC seasonal, sub-seasonal forecasting and for our signs. But after this, we still need to do those CFS uh, sensitivity tests by isolating the effect of snow effect from ocean state effect. If confirmed, that's a big deal in terms of sub-seasonal to seasonal prediction. And uh, now I have to talk about our snow work and uh, then I need to emphasize the implications for R2O or the NCF. That's one of my main purposes here to try to push the envelope. And uh, we know this famous NOAA funnel for R2O. 
And uh, earlier, I mentioned our credibility in terms of two decades of successful collaboration with EMC in terms of R2O. Now, even with our experience, <coughs> and further, we assume we get the funding to develop a better global three snow depths and snow fracking products by using our new snow density model, our new data <coughs> development methodology, <coughs> and potentially new remote sensing data source. And second, we have another friend here. So we work with our EMC partners to implement the new data for snow data simulation in CFS, GFS, and GPS. And the third, we work with our partners here to finish the standard suite of operational tests. The question is, based on everything I just said, do you think our snow staff will actually be implemented in CFS based on the NCEP criterion that the new parameterization or data set should reduce a known deficiency here in the snow, but does not degrade other aspects of the forecasting. I mean, that's uh, another reason I want to mention our credibility. It's not an average group claiming you have something new without even understanding the operational challenge. Even from my group, do you think our staff will be implemented? Well, I will tell you the answer, but hold on. Here, I have the results to hint the answer. Because we have the actual data overcome us. So here, we show the comparison for the top panels of results over Idaho, Wisconsin, and the Maine. Black nine is our three. Other colored nines are the forecastings from January, February, March, April. <coughs> we know the January forecasting three is more realistic than April, even though even January forecasting three is still an uh, underestimate. And uh, now, next, the bottom panels, the red panel, we show the difference of the two meter air temperature difference between CFS and observation. That observation is developed by my group, is our global uh, half, uh, half degree hourly air temperature data set. You can see actually the CFS, seasonal forecasting of two meter temperature for the bottom right panel on average is not that bad. It's pretty impressive. However, if you have a more realistic suite, that's based on the January 1st forecasting for the bottom left panel, you see much worse temperature bears. And what's the point? The point is the most realistic suite from January forecast would need to greater temperature cold bears because of the CFS deficiencies. In atmospheric processes, I would guess primarily linked to radiative transfer. In other words, if your snow is right, if you don't change your atmospheric model, you are going to mess up even more. And that's why the answer is if we just follow our current criteria, our snow will not be implemented. And uh, then what's the right approach? That's the envelope I want to push. The more productive approach would be first, improve snow indigenization. And the second, because we know there is a deficiency in the atmospheric model, we have to next improve atmospheric relative transfer, such as interaction with clouds and aerosols. Okay, I'm not saying it's easy, <coughs> but that's something that has to be done. And then we know there are deficiencies in the land model, we come back to improve land model. If we can finish those three steps, we would have something probably better than anywhere because snow is a big deal. Everywhere I talk with the people, everybody agrees. We don't know how to handle snow yet. So it's a very challenging issue. Here is the opportunity, but we have to change the approach. Otherwise, nothing will happen. And. Uh, Instead of just read those words, I will stop here if there are any questions or comments.
So we certainly have time for some questions. Um, okay. Yeah, maybe I, I can, you know, the very good talk, uh, Professor Zhang Jia. <coughs> So the, I want to mention to you, you know, I know you <coughs> study all, or mostly based on the CFS forecast, okay? The NGDPS for the global feature is a unified system, you know that one, but the focus on three time this weather forecast, week two and a sub-seasonal, then seasonal. The, I'm responsible for running global ensemble. Global ensemble is tasked to Extend forecast to all to the 35 day, 45 day. That's subsidized. You know. We attend to the the. We try to have a unified system, have same physics, but uh, consider the different time scales. I don't think there's many physical package talk say the scale where <coughs> that in special or temporal. But I'm still a worry about it's r not really scale where. So in the physics package, probably from. Uh, from a short range to the climate, that have some difference. Yes. Climate, right? Mm -hmm. So, so the my ensembles should be in between in the weather and the season, because the extent of subsidence, you know, consider the ocean impact, you know, and uh, many other factors. So, so what I know, you know, consider the all the study over here. Can you future shift a little bit? You know, consider the ensembles, the Include a simulation and a forecast to cover the subseason. You know, <coughs> looking for the more collaboration to see the impact of the subseason. You, you, you know, we actually do the subseasonal here. I, I like your comments. And second, I mean, when we talk about the O two R, people don't always realize. Say for CFS RR, there are multiple ensemble members forecasting every month. And frankly, we can never do that. As, as a university professor, those are <coughs> things we like. So we are actually analyzing the ensemble means. The results shown here are ensemble means rather than from a single realization. And uh, here, all those research are not supported by NOAA. It's by the private sector and uh, <coughs> by other organizations. We, that's why we have not really look at anything for NGGPS, but uh, for CFS, we care about O2R, <coughs> so we look at the results from CFS, GFS, and, and the NAM. That's part of the reason. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. CFS especially have a long record, you know, re forecast and... Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So another question, sorry, well, another question is probably the more the, the, the we run two years the extent forecast for global, you, you know, the uncoupled is uh, just the uh, atmosphere with the uh, SST forcing, different forcing. We evaluated the, the two years, look at the temperature scale beyond the week two, week three, four, is very minor, less scale. Precipitation is no scale, okay? Yeah. It's very interesting since that we found out that the temperature have a um, very little scales the, for northern hemisphere, but come to the look at the corners. Corners even worse, have mm -hmm. a much less skill. Mm -hmm. Can you give a more explanation why that is the case, you know? Well, well this, this week three, week four forecasting is a real challenge everywhere, so it's not surprising. And uh, then the, the any source of predictability would be very much valued. And again, there are not many sources. Ocean, in, say, in summer, in springtime, is limited in winter, is much better. And uh, here we're just saying, you know, snow provides a very good potential source of predictability for springtime <coughs> and early summer. But overall, that's a very challenging science question. I mean, I don't think anybody has the, the answer today. We're all in the same boat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, we'll entertain you long and then wait on I have a question. Look at your, your work. If you compare CFS, you know, you, you use Idaho and Wisconsin and others. If you look at your figure for the Wisconsin, is the most very plain. This, this, if you look at the general, look at reasonable compare. Because I know if, I know your, uh, Black is for four kilometer, right? Yeah. And others you use a larger coarse uh, resolution. Yeah. For for all my work, I just do some GL dots, analog dots. 
This is if you have the higher resolution, if we do an average, this should be give more higher swing. And if go to the post resolution, it's give is lower. This means the some some part is the look, uh, for example, if for your work is very easy, just uh, do your benchmark to same resolution for the for, for example, GFS, and then do comparison, perhaps it's more reasonable. We, we actually have done all of those. Okay. So for both the model outputs and also for remote sensing, we have done both. That is, we have also interpolate our data to the native resolution of the products. All conclusions are essentially the same. Okay. Yeah. Um, Michelle, is it quick? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your talk. I have uh, several questions, but uh, here just the first one. For this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, to the temperature, the January is a very cold bias. The temperature. Uh, this is uh, April <coughs> to June. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, if you use the January first, oh, the, the snow temperature. Sure. Bias. Excuse yeah. me. Oh, please. <coughs> uh, whoever's online, please <coughs> mute. So the reason is uh, besides you talk the, the radiation issues you just mentioned, mm -hmm. I think that maybe other mm -hmm. the maybe the because the high uh, the deep snow, the it's maybe the, the very stable boundary condition <coughs> issue. So in the CFS or GFS of the snow area, the temperature to me temperature could bias. It's very severe. Okay. Yeah, especially for the uh, wind or spring. Mm -hmm. So this may be the other issue. <coughs> so what, what you are saying is that for the land surface model, because there is only one snow layer, it's challenging to handle the thick snow pack. Yeah, uh, 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 what I say is uh, uh, the land and atmosphere coverage, the surface layer. For very stable conditions, the surface layer skin has a problem. Okay, I so agree. So the question or the comments from Wei Zhong is that for winter time, for very stable boundary layer, yeah. land surface could be decoupled from yeah, the decoupled. atmosphere, yeah, yeah. making the temperature prediction very challenging. It is true. It's a problem. For any models, NCEP model, European yeah, yeah, yeah. model, so everywhere. So you are saying besides the radiation, that could be another area. I agree. Yes. Yeah. So uh, like now in the next version of CFS, uh, GFS, we uh, have already solution to solve this uh, decovery. Okay. So or address it, maybe not completely solve it. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 that's that. Yeah. Okay, so I mean for <laughs> for people online, I mean we do again mention for the next release of GFS, they will have some fix yeah. to help reduce uh, this yeah. decoupling issue. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, can we go back to your second to the last slide and, and uh, I'll just kind of close with this. Second to the last slide. Yeah, so the more productive approach improved the snow initialization, atmospheric radiative transfer, and I guess maybe more generally the atmospheric components, and finally improved the land model. I guess a lot of this stuff probably, it's more of a comment, happens concurrently, but um, uh, maybe I could ask this. Um, so how, how do we, in what mechanism do we improve the radiative transfer model or the, <coughs> basically the atmospheric <coughs> physics? Oh, well, that, that's a big problem, and again, okay, nobody has that <coughs> magic solution. You have to find, I mean, your own staff scientists and uh, good external partners <coughs> who understand the model physics to work together. There is no simple solution. I'm not saying anybody can solve this type of model physics problem <coughs> in three months or six months, but if you have the partners are working together. But even more important thing is the willingness to recognize if you have really dramatic improvement in one component, you have to adjust the other parts. I feel that's the more important signal. Say, if you improve the atmospheric model, then you have to adjust the land model and the potentially ocean model 
to make sure the overall performance is better. If you are not willing to do that additional adjustments, you are going to drop most of the good stuff you want for your implementation. I feel that's really even more important than how to resolve that model improvement issue in the atmosphere. That's really challenging. Sure. And uh, by the way, that's your job and another uh, Mike's job, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was mostly paving the way for <laughs> examining, examining the parameterizations kind of in an isolated mode and then, um, and then more and more coupling in kind of a hierarchy. And that's actually <laughs> via our partners and so on. Um, thanks for the laugh on the line, by the way. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, I, I, I think to, to f with our partners, e examine the parameterizations just right down to the smallest parts and then put them together progressively in coupling. Because, yeah, I mean, it, it's like driving down the road and I'm used to my car pulling left. And so now I'm pulling back to the, pulling back to the right. And to go straight, and somebody then fixes the alignment. Oh, well, wait a minute. I, I'm always kind of pulling this way, and now I'm going off in the wrong direction. So, uh, um, you know, the car analogies I make often, maybe I should be more green and talk about a bicycle. But we have to recognize that we have the sum of a lot of parts. If we have a well-tuned system, but we know there's a deficiency in one area, then we have to make sure that we have a way to concurrently look at those other deficiencies and know that we... We have to uh, not just have a very...